Okay, so our topic today is multivariate inheritance and response to selection. By response to selection, we're just going to look at the response to selection is over a single generation. Uh, where you're going to see there's going to be a different different way of looking at that than in the <coughs> univariate case. Um, and I've got this this icon of uh, Wilson's bird of paradise. Uh, and uh, Wilson's bird of paradise I chose as our icon for today because this male bird of paradise is multi is manifestly multivariate, right? That's when when I look at Wilson's bird of paradise, the first thing I see is a multivariate phenotype, a wow multivariate phenotype. <coughs> the second thing I admire about Wilson's bird of paradise is the bald head, which uh, I find uh, both amusing and comforting, and. Uh, <laughs> And I like the fact that, that this bird of paradise has a blue bald head. I think that's, that's cool. So, but, the, but here's the point. Uh, if any organism that you're interested in has a multivariate phenotype. And what we're going to talk about today and, and, and next lecture is the problem of taking a univariate view on what's manifestly a, a multivariate phenotype and a multi-evolutionary process for the evolution of that phenotype. And so uh, uh, the price we're going to pay to master the univariate approach, the multivariate approach, is a little matrix algebra. It's just it's just necessary. And uh, but it's not going to be so hard. And uh, and if you haven't done matrix or linear algebra, we'll we'll do we'll do a little practice. There's how many of you now? Be honest with me. How many of you tried the tutorial on matrix algebra? Yeah. Okay. So maybe that was helpful. But if you haven't tried that in this you get overwhelmed by matrices, you're probably not, but if you are, then that's a place to go. Uh, let's see, can I do this? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so our, we have three theses today. Uh, the first one is that uh, the same paradigm that we use for a single trait can be applied to multiple traits, uh, so we're gonna extend to the multi multivariate case. The way I think about it is the univariate case is a special case of this multivariate case. So now today we're going to look at the general case. Uh, guess what? The key statistical parameter uh, in the world we'll explore is the G matrix. It's not the key parameter for all models of phenotypic value, but it's going to be for the one we use today. And we're going to, just as the G matrix affected, just as G, the scalar, affects the univariate response to of the univariate mean to selection and drift, to drift and response to selection, the G matrix is going to play a comparable role in uh, the multivariate world. And we will, we will, uh, I think, abundantly support all three of those uh, claims. Okay, here's what we're going to do. <coughs> we're going to look at multivariance resemblance between parents and offspring. We'll start very soon with a parent-offspring plot, an offspring by parent plot. Uh, as not surprisingly, we're going to talk about our model of inheritance that's going to be multivariate. Uh, there will be a couple of examples. When we think about mutation selection balance, and in, we're going to think about the G matrix in mutation selection balance, and it's affected by opposing forces. And later today, Adam Jones, let me introduce Adam. Where is he? Oh, there you are. You're in that corner. Adam Jones is going to help us carry the multivariate theme, and he's going to talk about uh, the stability uh, and evolution of the G matrix uh, at the end of today. And so I'll introduce that in a very crude way, but uh, er Adam will uh, talk about that in greater detail, including epistasis. Uh, you're going to get to epistasis, aren't you? And we're all psyched about that. Raise your hand if you're psyched about epistasis. Okay, good. Yeah, see, you've got to do that. Uh, and uh, okay, we t and then the G matrix affects the evolution of the multivariate mean. And we will talk about drift later. I don't think I do it today. All right. Well, let's talk about multivariate resemblance. Now, um, so far as I know, uh, Francis Galton never, never did a char one character by, by another character plot. I'm not aware of it. I, I don't think he did that. Uh, but in any case. I, I, I should say that um, Fran uh, Carl Pearson did a lot of multivariate statistics. Yeah. Yeah. So, but whether... I mean, he was one of the inventors of some of the early multivariate yeah. methods. True, but I don't think... Well, at any rate, I think this kind of plot came on the scene relatively late. I don't think we had people doing these kinds of plots until maybe the 1940s or something like that, when 
selection on deliberate selection on multivariate things. At any rate, this is this is much later than Galton. And let, notice we met, we're, here's our garter snake example. We have two traits: number of vertebrae in the body, number in the tail. And there are two cross trait plots that we can make. Daughter's tail is a function of mom's body count, and then daughter's body is a function of mom's tail count. So now, if you haven't if you haven't steep yourself deeply in the multivariate case, these are these are strange things to think about. So we're going to we're going to think about what what this implies. What are the causes? Now, if you look at this plot, uh, there there seems to be a trend line. We I haven't even told you whether there's significance of that. It turns out we're not really going to be interested in the regression. We're going to be interested in the covariance. In this case, you know, you could doubt whether that's a trend. But it turns out that there is a significant relationship across traits in this in this data set. And the point is, a way of thinking about this is that, thinking back to the old Victorian way of putting this, the traits are running together in families. If you're if you're a family of violin players, you know maybe you're also good in mathematics. I'm, I'm making that up. Are those two trends that are those two traits to run together? Think of something that runs together. In other words, if you inherit if, you, if you're a redhead, uh, you also have light skin or something like that, right? So you, in those cases, you're thinking about traits that run together. And when you go modeling multivariate traits, you can't treat each trait separately. You've got to think from a, from a resemblance and inheritance point of view, you've got to think about the pairwise relationships between traits. Now, what we're going to say with our additive model is that's all you need. You don't have to do freeway, but you, you need to, you can build it all up from, from pairwise relationships. Okay, so here's our model. Uh, and this is why we spent some time on this before. We're going to have our hands full just keeping track of the multiple traits. That's going to use all the subscript, that we, we're going to need subscripting for that. So we're going to focus on the, the additive model in which x, the phenotypic value is little z, x is what? It's our breeding value. It's the sum of additive effects across loci for that particular trait. And then plus uh, 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 an, an environmental contribution. Now, here's the trick. Uh, to count for multiple traits, we're going to look at the two-trait case. We're going to have a, a vector. This is a column vector. This is the, an individual's value for trait 1. And it's in, in an individual's phenotypic value for trait 2. X, the breeding value, uh, the, or genetic value, uh, becomes a vector. Uh, breeding value for trait one, breeding value for trait two, <coughs> environmental value for trait one, and envi environmental value for trait two. Now, the lovely thing about this, anytime we do a vector like this, this, this generalizes it to n traits, right? It's just a question of how much data you want to collect. How many, how many times do you want to move your calipers around on your bat specimens, right? So you can, this vector can be very, very long. You can have n traits here, and, uh, and, and so too the model. We're just illustrating it for compactness with the bivariate case. Here's the phenotypic mean. Remember, we're, we're, we're thinking that these are uh, uncorrelated uh, parts of the model. Here, here the means, that's no surprise. The phenotypic variance now becomes the phenotypic variance covariance matrix. Here it is here. And these, these matrices that we're going to write down in this level of the model are always symmetrical. So on the main diagonal, we have the phenotypic variances for the two traits. In the off diagonal, this is uh, trait one with trait two. That's the same element as this, the trait one, you know, trait one with trait two. I mean, you, you might think this should be P21, but that's the same as P12, so the convention is to write it this way. Uh, likewise, when we look at the variance in, in breeding values, we've got to think about not only the variance in the breeding values of trait one and trait two, but we have to think about the covariance of breeding values for the two traits. And that was what was causing that off, you know, that tilt in our, our the last uh, couple of data plots. And, uh, and then here's our environmental values, and likewise, it's a matrix, there's an off diagonal element that's a, an environmental covariance. When you go to multiple traits, this becomes, uh, if, it, if there are n traits, then th these, two these three matrices are each n by n, right? They can be very big. And we'll, we hope to do uh, 
a computer exercise that will give you, uh, I think there's six by six matrices for some scalation traits, body vertebral and other counts and garter snakes. That will be our exercise. We'll actually play with estimation of, of matrices of this kind. We hope we have some interface problems to solve. Okay, so let's think about the G matrix. Um, the G matrix is going to figure at large in the formulations that come forward, that, that go forward from here, so we want to spend a little bit of time on it. And so let's think about what the G matrix is. In the first place, if we plotted genetic values for trait 1 against genetic values for trait 2. So, so for example, if, we, if you're using Wombat with your organism, one of the things that you would estimate would be the breeding values, I can't remember what they were called, uh, in your wombat output. <coughs> yeah. You estimate, you estimate, when you did. We estimated breeding values. You estimated breeding values, but if you had two traits, you'd have two breeding values for each individual. Yeah. And you, you could do a plot exactly like this, right? Mm -hmm. And that, then the, the cloud of, of values is your, is an expression of the, is what you're summarizing with the G matrix. You're trying to take account of the fact that there, there's a cloud there. And in particular, uh, then uh, this value on the main diagonal. Now I've standardized this, this, the, the data so that the, the genetic variance for, this, uh, for these breeding values is 1. The genetic variance for the other trait is 1. And so then on the, so, so, that's, so the spread this way and the spread that way in this particular example happens to be the same. The off diagonal element, so if, if the off diagonal element was 0, what would this ellipse look like? It would be completely round, wouldn't it? So, but in the general case, it's some kind of football shape, uh, and it might not be as extreme as this, or it might be more extreme. If, if this off-diagonal element, that's G12, if it's positive, the tilt is up this way. If it's negative, it's tilted down that way, right? Um, let me think. Oh, there, so there are two. What, where does this come from? We're, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but one possibility is thiotropy that at the, at the gene level, there's a set of genes that uh, affect expression of trait 1 and the expression of trait 2. And apparently, the net effect of those pleiotropies is positive. There might be some negative ones, but the, the apparently the positive, positive genes are outweighing those. The other possibility is linkage to equilibria that we have two loci, one affecting trait 1, and, and uh, another trait affecting, another locus affecting trait 2. And the alleles are in, in positive linkage disequilibrium, and that could produce that could do, produce a plot like this. In general, when we see covariance in genetic values, we don't know whether it's from pleiotropy or linkage disequilibrium. Well, then in a lot of cases, we can make a, we can make an informed guess. Not easy to tease those two things apart. You'd have you you might be able to at the genomic level. That's one of our. One of our agendas for the future, just as we have missing heritability in GWAS, we have missing covariance, right? So we have a ways to go. All right, a couple of other conventions. Uh, uh, entering the multivariate realm because of this means that you really want to embrace covariances. But if you want to standardize the the covariance and express it as a genetic correlation. And this is the standard formula, the standard product moment formula for a correlation. And we just substitute in the genetic covariance 1, 2, and then we take the square root of the product. That's the geometric mean of the two, uh, two genetic variances. Nothing new there. That's just applying a standard formula. You, you have deep in your storage, if not on the surface, to this genetic issue. And then here's our final set of conventions. I meant to quiz you about what the axes are, but this slide gives it away. Uh, what I'm going to draw here, and most of the time when we talk about matrices, we're going to talk about a set of matrices. Almost always you can, you can cast them as 95% confidence ellipse. And this is the, the bivariate 95% confidence ellipse for bivariate normal data. That's how it's cal calculated. And uh, we're 95% sure that the bivariate mean resides inside this ellipse. But it's also the case that about 5% of the value, we're expecting on the average about 5% of the values to be outside the ellipse. And I think this is 100 values, and you can see 
conveniently that five crept outside the boundary, just about what we'd expect. We can take this matrix and we can, uh, we can calculate its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Just a simple matrix operation. And from those, we can, we can plot the axes on the ellipse. Uh, and the axes, this first axis, you might recognize as the first principal component. It has another name. What, what is it? It's the first eigen, it's the leading eigenvector. It's the, eig it's the eigenvector that explains the most variance in this trait. And then here's the second principal component. I labeled it Roman numeral two. Some of, some of our authors will do that. And it's the axis orthogonal to the first one that explains the next most uh, 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 variance in genetic values. Okay, and so we'll be, we're gonna drop the, drop the red uh, uh, signatures later. Uh, and in fact, for theoretical conceptual slides, we'll even drop the data points, right? And every time we do this, you'll have to, we'll, we put an ellipse up, and you'll see a lot of ellipses today, won't we, Adam? Uh, you have to imagine a cloud uh, fitting snugly inside the ellipse and spilling over to it. Uh, and you could do any, you could do any confidence level, level you want. And another property is all of those confidence levels, if you did, the 99 and so forth, they, they would be a nested series of ellipses that would fit inside each other perfectly. So you draw one, you draw them all. Um, questions? Yep? Um, I'm just wondering if you calculate... Can we use, like can we use the microphone? Can we get a tradition going? Uh, the tradition of passing the microphone and remembering that green is on. The tradition Not like will also be of harassing and interrupting Okay, so um, when you calculate the eigenvectors, um, did you also use like a PCA to calculate it? Because you you're can, calling the, it the, the... For these data, you could. Because it's the genetic values, but if you don't just have the phenotypic values, you can't. So, so hence our solution, which is to calculate the ellipse directly from the G matrix. And yeah, but if you want to calculate, like if you just have your cloud of data points, yeah. and then you know that there are like genetic values for that trait, then you can do like a PCA you could. because it uses. You could. You could. Okay, but if it is the phenotypic values, then you can't do it because it's not because the because phenotypic they aren't, values. In general, genetic these values aren't observable, but you can estimate the G matrix. So if you did if you did wombat, you could actually estimate genetic values for indiv individuals, and you could you could do what you're saying. But in general, a simple and this is what we're going to do computationally. Once you have any of the matrices, you know P, G, or E, if you have the matrix, you can. There's a matrix operation eigenvector. I think it's called transparently an R. Eigen. And you go eigen G, eigen parent G and it spits out for you your eigenvectors and your eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are equivalent to the variances along the two axes. Mm -hmm. Very straightforward. Now, anybody that's used R knows that you have to stop and think about, <laughs> when we're, we're gonna look at some R output and you go, hey, what is the first and what's the second eigenvector? Uh, so we're gonna... <laughs> You'd think that would be simple, but uh, we're going to have to puzzle with that. Well, it's going to be a little trickier when we go to selection services and we surfaces and we use the same uh, same uh, R statement. Yeah. Yes. Um, you talk about uh, linkage disequilibrium. Yeah. But in absence of pleiotropy, linkage disequilibrium doesn't give. Uh, necessarily genetic covariance, right, between traits? Not necessarily, no. Because no. they can be right. random alleles. Right. It's, yes. Okay. Not necessarily. Right. And so it's it's possible that you have that you have linkage disequilibrium in which the positive associations are balancing out the you know the negative ones or something like that. Just as you could have positive and negative pleiotropy or pleiotropy canceling each other. Uh, so with respect to the the character scale, when we say linkage to equilibrium, you mean you're seeing, you're seeing a pattern uh, in the off-diagonal elements that arises from that source. So. 
Um, okay, forward. Those are our conventions. Okay, so here's an actual example. And here's, a, here's we're going to end up with a, a G matrix. So these, this, these are estimates from the actual uh, examples that we talked about before. Remember, here's our plot of daughter versus mom's uh, body vertebrae. Here's the daughter versus mom's tail vertebrae. Right here, here's the egregious outlier. What's the other one you don't like? You don't like that one? Anyway, there. Uh, I'm not, you know, yeah, I would love to trim out those four, but you know, here we are. This is nature. Okay, so here are our two off diagonal plots, our two cross trait plots. And uh, what we do to estimate G12 is just take the average of these two. There's a covariance. Each, each of these, under our model, each of the covariances in these plots should be an expression of G12. And so we have two estimates, if you want to think of it that way, and we're averaging those two to get G12. You with me? Trait two against trait one. Sorry. Yeah, well, anyway, let me not try to say it. You know what I'm talking about. We're going to average the two, the two covariances that we see in these two plots. Yeah. Yes. My microphone. Microphone person. Here, here, here. I, I'll be the microphone person. What happened to the other two microphones? This this brings us closer together. Uh. Is there any significance of the scaling of the numbers in the G matrix, and would it ever matter? Well, it's going to affect your, it's going to affect your estimate. So that scale decision should happen, whatever those criteria are for deciding on a scale should happen before you. So for example, if you standardize your scales to unit variances, then your covariances are always going to be correlations, right? So, so in this case, it's like 8.17 what? These are non-dimensional numbers. Okay. They're non-dimensional. They don't have units. Well. The square roots have units. Well, their units would be the square of the uh, units and the. If you want to think of squared bodies. So if they're bushels per year, they're square bushels. Yeah. Um, which is strange. But uh, I just want to say that the, an additional feature of principal components is well, a feature, actually, a feature it doesn't have, I'm sorry, backwards, uh, a feature it doesn't have is that if you change the units on one of your uh, variables and then you get the principal components, even after you, you correct the, the units back, you're, you don't have the same principal component. That is, if you, if you, you, the principal component is the direction in which there's the greatest variance. And if you change the units, then the, your measurement of what the variance is changes in a, in a you know, non-trivial way. And you can, you can get a different set of axes as a result. Sure. So uh, put it another way, the matrix and the eigenvector and eigenvalues that you get are functions of the scale you've adopted, whatever it is. So uh, your values may vary according to what transformation you might have used on the same data set. So, you have, to, uh, you have to be aware of that. And this is something that our colleague David Huell, Huell is, is probably going to be on your prelim question set. So I'm just guessing. I'm, it's good, you think it's going to be there too, don't you? Yeah. OK, I just want to confirm. So the G matrix you get from, an, it's a, you estimate it using these kinds of models. Using a that's model right, like what right. Wombat is, that's so right. okay, so you don't so, use the phenotypic so in this case, directly. If you wanted from these regressions, you could get estimates of the covariance, right, by multiplying the the slopes that I'm showing here by the the denominator, mm -hmm. and you 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 would take that, you would estimate the genetic variance, you know, from that from that covariance right here in each case. In in the case of the off diagonal, you've got two estimates of covariance and you average those and that becomes your estimate of G12. I mean, I'm doing this example because this is a lot more transparent than Wombat. Mm -hmm. We love Wombat for its power, but it's also, it's also kind of cryptic about what, it, what it's doing. I mean, to everyone except Karen Meyer you know, <laughs> and, and, and Pat Carter. Yeah, so and I have one more maybe yeah. trivial question. Is there any reason that the 
the counts look like they're discretized on the mom's body and the mom's tail, but not the daughter's tail or daughter's body? Yeah, because the mom is a single individual always, and, and this trait, right, you've got whole vertebrae. But when we take the average of daughters, we can get fractional value. Nice observation. Yes, in the uh, back. So, the, uh, something to say quickly, uh, averaging the covariances, uh, is that because we need this matrix to be um, uh, symmetrical? Or uh, why, yes. why do we not leave the um, covariances estimated on the original? Our points? model, our model is, is basically assuming that these are symmetrical. Okay. Right. They're equal. And so we're, we're, remember, we are slaves to our model. We, we are. We buy into the model, we, uh, we buy into the model. Okay, this is, these are all good questions, right? Because we want to be comfortable with the G matrix. Are you, let's, let's go for the 90%, 95% confidence level. Do you feel 95% comfortable with the G matrix? Raise your hand. Okay, otherwise see me at lunch. We'll work, we'll work, or you can do additional reading, but uh, you've got to be comfortable with it. Okay, preval prevalence of genetic covariance. So an obvious thing to do if we, if we this is Derek Roth, uh, so this is actually um, uh, Kim Masso, his student uh, now at the University of South Carolina, and Derek Roth summarizing the literature uh, on life history traits and morphological traits, life history traits in light color, morphological traits in black. And we're gonna be comparing studies so it makes sense to sort of normalize everything to a genetic correlation, right? So the point here is there's a, there's a lot of genetic covariance. We don't get a distribution that's peaked about zero with tails. A lot of pairs of traits in a lot of studies are pretty strongly correlated, even exceeding the parameter values of, of a correlation, right? We should have values going from minus one to one. We spill over on both sides because of errors of this estimation. But the point is, the point we're making here is that it would be hazardous to assume that your traits are not genetically correlated. I mean, they, they might be positive, they might be negative, but they're probably not z zero in their correlation. And, and an interesting thing which uh, comes out of, uh, of uh, trade-off uh, thoughts, or reinforces trade-off thoughts, is it's very common to see negative genetic correlations between life history traits. Some are, some are positive, but, but uh, uh, quite a lot are negative. Okay, so it's a complicated thing. So this, this is just a survey. Uh, and um, maybe in the notes I tell you what the sample size is. Okay, here's our fourth topic. Why don't we uh, run out of genetic variance and covariance? Well, uh, what we're thinking is that we're in, that we've got a balance of opposing forces, that we've got mutation. Uh, so this is the G matrix, the you know express variation in the G matrix. There's some uh, linkage disequilibrium, and we're shuttling that in and out of the express variation with by an interplay between stabilizing selection, say, and recombination. So this is a model in which we've got mutation selection balance, where selection is stabilizing selection, and we're imagining that the G matrix is nibbled away by stabilizing selection, but restored by mutation, just as it was in the scalar case. Here now we're thinking about the multivariate case. And again, uh, I'm gonna defer to uh, Adam's lecture and exercise in the afternoon where we're gonna, we're gonna look at uh, you know, how long it takes to achieve a mutation selection balance of, of this kind. Uh, uh, actually, we're gonna do uh, mutation selection drift balance because we'll always have finite populations in uh, Adam's uh, Adam simulations. Basically because Adam is too lazy to uh, simulate an infinite size population. He, he, uh, he gets, he wants to get his runs done within his lifespan for some reason. <laughs> no, the real reason is because we want to know what the effect of finite population size would be on this. Okay, so. Yeah, it's the second day I'm loosening up. I'm trying to uh, uh, expose you to my perverse sense of humor, which, uh, <laughs> which will be expressed more and more as the course wears on. By, the, by, by Saturday, I'm almost impossible to talk to because nothing I say will be... His, his sense of humor case. is still limited by a little bit of residual jet lag. <laughs> I'll be totally buzzing and sharp by Saturday, I promise you. 
they'll be all humor. Okay, let's talk a little more about linkage disequilibrium. Um, uh, what, so, one of the things that we worry about is why, now that we're in multivariate space, why don't we run out of additive genetic covariance? Well, so here's a contrived example to illustrate linkage disequilibrium and why it might be created each generation by selection, but then eroded by recombination. So, so why is this, this is, this is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, a genus. I can't think of a grasshopper genus, but we call this Arnoldo Grillis uh, uh, linkage disequilibrium. And okay, so at any rate, uh, here's, here's the inheritance scheme that I can try. If, you're, if you've got the big A uh, allele at locus A and you've got the big B allele at locus B, then you're a totally green grasshopper. If you've got little a, little a, little b, little b genotype, you're a brown grasshopper. But if you've got these kinds of mismatched genotypes, you, you've got a brown head and a green body, or a green head and a gr brown body, okay? Why is this so? Because this is Arnoldo Grillis, and I, you know, I, I say it is. It's like, I'm making it, this is a, a, a hypothetical example for illust illustrative purposes. It's like fantasy natural history, right? Okay. The, created it. Huh? You specially created it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are words I hate to use, but uh, <laughs> I see you laughing, so yes, they, I specially created this example. Okay, so here's the second point. Let us suppose, and this is, this is from a natural history point, not unreasonable to assume. Let's suppose, suppose that these are cryptic to birds, and so are these. Matched phenotypes are cryptic because you're either sitting on a green leaf or a, a dead leaf, right? These, so what happens each generation? Selection hammers the grasshopper population and tends to eliminate these genotypes and these genotypes tend to increase in frequency from the sample before until the sample after selection, right? So this, is a, this, is a, this isn't stabilizing selection. This is a particular kind of stabilizing selection in which we're saying selection is favoring, in this case, this contrived case, phenotypes on this diagonal. We're going to call that correlational selection. It is, in general, that kind of selection, multivariate selection, we're going to talk about it more, is going to uh, tend to increase the correlation between the state values of the traits, right? And in this case, because of the contrived genetic background, that selection is going to promote linkage disequilibrium between the two loci that underlie the trait. It's going to create uh, a genetic covariance between at the, at the level of these two loci. That genetic covariance is going to be expressed uh, at the phenotypic level, if we estimated a G matrix for these traits, not knowing the, the genotypes, we should get a positive G12 element. Okay? You with me? Why not? Uh, <laughs> there's nothing to quibble about, right? Because we can drive this to work this way. Now, one thing we could worry about is how stable this linkage disequilibrium is going to be. It's created by by selection each generation, but you remember from population genetics that recombination is going to break up those alleles as we get recombination. So to really create a, a genetic covariance of any magnitude, real magnitude, we'd have to have closely linked loci. Uh, and so what we're talking about here is in, in Sao Paulo, as in all parts of the right thinking uh, uh, multivariate uh, uh, spaces in academia, we're talking about the evolution of genetic in integration of this trait. We're creating a, a, an expression of this integration, that is, we've got an integrated correlated phenotype, uh, is this the underlying process of linkage disequilibrium. But what we're going to argue is when we think about whether by pleiotropy or linkage disequilibrium, uh, the, a positive force to produce integration of the phenotype is the, this correlational selection, which we're going to talk about in detail, uh, uh, I think, tomorrow. Questions here before we go on? Wow. You're happy with, you're happy with. Um, couldn't a positive assortative mating also cause this linkage disequilibrium in this um, case? 
where the green grasshoppers Not are mating. Selection. Well, what if they're only mating with green grasshoppers? Then you have big A, big A always together. And I defer to to my colleague Joe. Who yeah, who, I, you who better he, defer. You dream yeah. about LD every night. Actually. Well, I, people don't realize I started working on LD. Um, the uh, Yes. Short answer is yes. Uh, assortative mating can create linkage disequilibrium, strangely enough, and maintain it even in the face of recombination, because as you as you intuited, the um, it it puts together, it brings together individuals who maybe let's say let's say it was large size they were assortatively mating for. If you had two genes both contributing to large size, you would tend to non-randomly the the individuals where the result of two large size individuals mating will get both of those large size alleles non-randomly and the individuals who are small at the other end of the scale the opposite. So it actually does uh, create links disequilibrium. But isn't it more fragile than a linkage disequilibrium that's reinforced by this kind of selection each generation? Well, it's, it's, it's not, if you continue assortative mating, uh, it's maintained. And that could happen on a very quantitative trait as well, right? Where large individuals are mating only with large individuals, yeah. and that's underlined by mean, 50 it's, genes. It's, it's possible. It's not inevitable, and, and uh, it, it, it just depends upon the trait. Uh, but I think it would be fair to say you can't be doing assortative mating for hundreds of traits all at the same time, partly because it will dilute the assortative mating for any one of them. Okay, um, we're moving on. Okay, so now we're to uh, the fifth part, which is uh, changing the multivariate mean with selection. And so now we have a vector to we have a vector to change, not just the scalar value. And so let's go back, and here we're going to look at the effect of genetic covariance on the response to selection on one trait. Uh, and so uh, we're going to see that selection on one trait can cause a correlated response on the other. So for example, let's go back and just think of this as, this is a new mid-parent value for trait one, offspring value for trait two plot, right? Offspring, so the covariance we're looking here at this plot, taking the sample before selection, both blue and black points, uh, is negatively correlated. Uh, so when we estimate a parameter here, it's going to be negative, and that parameter we're going to be estimating is the genetic covariance between trait one and trait two, right? So this, in a, this negative relationship in this plot is going to give us a negative estimate of G12. Okay, so just as, now in general, this, this plot is a little bit cumbersome to use, and it's misleading for many ways, but for just thinking about what the consequences of selecting on one trait on the other is, it's, it's illuminating to think about that. So it's the same operation as before. We imagine that there's truncation selection so that only the black dotted individuals become the parents of the next generation. And here's their mean. Let's see, have I done this backwards? No, I haven't. Done, no. Yes, I, yes, I've done it right. So uh, I'm gratified to see. So the mean of all the parents after selection is z bar star. That's the mean of all the black points. The mean of all of the points on this axis, blue and black, is z bar, the mean before selection. And so we're selecting positively, aren't we? S is literally the length of this, this separation between the two means, and that's, that's S, our selection differential, right? We're selecting towards higher values. But when we project z bar up to the axis, it's actually lower on the scale than z, z bar star is actually lower here than z bar. And so when we calculate delta z bar, the change in the mean, we act, even though we select for positive values in one trait, we get a change in negative values in the other trait, right? right? And that's because of this, this it shouldn't be a surprise, but it's not all that intuitive. Now animal breeders are familiar with this because the tragedy of animal breeding is as you select on something, you get, because of the, the ubiquity of pleiotropy and uh, genetic covariances, it's very common in animal and plant breeding to select on something and then get something you, you really don't like, right? This is, this is why we like, uh, we like, uh, we like uh, what do you call them, heritage uh, styles of uh, tomatoes, right? 
that's why you, this is why you buy your tomatoes at the farmer's market instead of at, at Winco or whatever, Piggly Wiggly. Uh, the reason is when you select on, uh, on uh, a tomato for transportation from California to, uh, to Minnesota, you get a correlated response to selection that you don't really want and you get a sort of tasteless, you know, but your corporate, your corporate values are such that you want to put a premium on transportation, and so we all bear the, the price of that correlated response to selection. Nobody intended that to happen, but it's the, it's, I like to think of heart, there's the heartbreak of psoriasis, this is the heartbreak of genetic co negative genetic covariance, right? Okay, but this is exactly the sort of thing that we have to take account of when we think about selection and its, its consequences in a multivariate format. Okay, so that gets us to our new version plus pop-up. No, okay, it went away. Our new version of the delta z-bar equation. Now look at, look at this. This is the same equation we had before, right, in the univariate case. And what we did in the univariate case is trundle down the same path that blazed by J. Lush and others, and we collected these two terms. What, what are these two terms in the univariate case? Oh, I'm sorry. What are these two terms? Heritability. That's heritability, right? Now we're going to collect the terms this way, and we're going to talk about this for the next couple lectures. We're going to collect the terms this way, and we're going to call this a measure of selection. We're going to call that beta. And we will show later that it's reasonable to think of beta. We're actually going to show right now that it's reasonable to think of beta as being the direct force of selection on the characters, and it's a convenient way to think about selection in the multivariate case. So when we think about delta z bar, as soon as we go to two characters or however many characters, this is a very convenient way to go. You can't actually collect terms this way. Well, anyway, I, won't, I won't even talk about this. this it's going to be very convenient to do it this way. And I'm going to illustrate that by blowing up the response to selection equation. So now it's going to be, not surprisingly, a vector, right? We have the, the change in the mean of trait one and the change in the mean of trait two. And we're going to say that that's a product of two things using this form. The G matrix post multiplied by the now vector of direct selection forces, which we're going to call beta. So unfortunately, we wish we had a Greek, book, a Greek alphabet with about 50 characters, right? Because if that were true, then Pat wouldn't have used beta for, for uh, <laughs> for one of his most important, what was it? It was the vector of uh, fixed effects. Yeah. Fixed effects yesterday. Okay, erase that from your memories. For today, we're redefining beta. Beta is going to be this direct force of selection. It's, it's these two things multiplied together. We'll talk, we're going to talk quite a lot about it. Okay, so now for a little matrix reminder. Uh, <clears throat> let's just stop and rem remind ourselves that if we want to do this product, we multiply this row times that column, and it gives us this value, right? G11 times B1, beta 1, that's this term, plus this term, G12 times beta 2, that gives us this term, right? Likewise, for the, the second value in the, in the response vector, it's this row times that column, so it's this element times that element, there it is. This element times that element, there it is there. Okay, so um, so let's, I have to remember where I go off, I think I'm still here, but uh, I guess, guess it doesn't matter that much. Look at what the response to selection for trait 1 is composed of. G11 times beta 1, 1, and then G12 times beta 2. So think about what that must mean. The response to selection is composed of two parts. A natural interpretation is that the direct force of selection on, first, on the first trait acting through the genetic variance for that trait produces what we're going to call a direct response to selection. But the direct force of selection on trait two acting on the genetic covariance between those two traits is going to also produce a, co a correlated response to selection. And likewise for the second trait, except I've got the terms in the, in the reverse order because we wanted to see the matrix rule clear and simple. 
Okay, so in the notes, so it, it so so we can't just think about, we have to think in general about the possibility of both of these terms having reality, and they'll have reality to the, to the extent correlated responses to selection will, will actually occur to the extent we have selection on correlated traits and that we have a genetic covariance between the traits in question. Okay, so I'm going to do one more thing and then I'll answer questions if you have them. Let's imagine that we went to the, this is, this is a contrived example, right, just so we don't go crazy right off. We've just got two traits. But imagine that we had many, many traits, maybe n traits. So now the vector is very long. The matrix is n by n. This is very long. We have selection potentially on all n traits. And now we look at this, we look at this, this term. So let me do the, let me do the product for you. We're going to have this term. That's the first term. We're going to have this term. This term is going to be G13 beta 3 plus G14 beta 4 plus G15 beta 5 all the way out to G1n beta n, right? So if we're dealing with multivariate selection, which is what na Mother Nature uh, is probably going to be pursuing, uh, it's very possible that all these correlated responses to selection can overwhelm the, the direct response. Very possible. And so that's what, uh, that's the, one of the heartbreaks. It's the challenge and the heartbreak of the multi-dimensional multi world. And likewise for trait, trait, trait two. Okay, so we're, I think we're, what, what, when we were, we started at nine, I'm probably five minutes over. But we're almost at our, 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 our end. So actually, let's, let's go ahead and then we'll, we'll put things in the discussion if you're not throwing your arms up right now. OK, so now, uh, so there, that's the, el that's the algebra, algebra of multivariate response to selection. Now, in, in the case of a single character, we had the contrived Dalton plot with, with S on it, right? And that, that was a convenient way to think about uh, selection. That's not a convenient way when we're in multivariate space. And I, I've already said a convenient way is to go to this new measure of selection beta. And now I'm going to show you a visualization of, of the matrix algebra that we just looked at. And the visualization is to think of selection as a, as a pool game. How many of you have played pool? Good, everyone. See, it's, it's, now I meant to uh, talk to my IT guy so I'd have a pool cue here. So, uh, but, <laughs> but, I, but uh, better, I have an animation. But before we do the animation, let's, let's look at our little diagram. So this is going to be uh, our G matrix. And here it is with, uh, there's no genetic correlation. And we've got a genetic variance of 0.4. Remember, our phenotypic variances are 1. So this is like, these are like heritabilities. Uh, and it was so, so with a G matrix like this, we've got, we have a, a, a soccer ball in, in two dimensions. Beta is a vector. We're saying here that we have selection only on trait one. And we're going to look at the consequences of that. Now, uh, remember beta, beta one times, uh, times this element, the genetic variance in the, in the, in the G matrix, is it going to produce a response to selection? And beta is going to be, in general, less than 1. I'll tell you about why later. So uh, uh, the consequence of that is that, um, that when, we, when we select on the trait, we get a response to selection that's less than the magnitude of, the, of beta. And uh, we can think of each of those vectors in, in this particular cry case as looking like this. So you can think it's like a pool game because you hit the cue ball here. And you move the mean within a generation to that new position represented by the open cue ball. Now, in the case of uh, a circular G matrix, this whole, this whole result here can just be rotated all the way around, right? No matter how you hit the cue ball. Uh, and this is, this is a conventional cue ball. This is the conventional cue ball that you play, the conventional game you play. When you move around the table, <laughs> You don't have to think about where the ball is going to go, right? It goes, you hit it this way, it goes forward. It doesn't matter what angle you're doing it at. But 
if there's a if there's a G matrix with an off diagonal element, I've shown here a positive G12, when you hit the ball in this direction, it goes not forward. It has two components, forward and then also a component upward. Okay, there's the response, there's delta Z bar, first element one, and then there, here's del delta Z bar, element delta Z bar two, right? There's a correlated response to selection, uh, even though we're selecting only on trait one, and so we get this result. Now, because, of, because you're playing pool with a G matrix that's not round, uh, it's going to matter very much where, which angle you hit the cue ball at. Okay, and so I'm going to show you a couple of animations. I have to eat up some uh, discussion time to do that, but go away. What? Okay, I'm just going to ignore you. Let's, let's play animation one. Maybe somebody can tell me how to make this go away every time. Wait for it. Wait for it. You like? <laughs> yes. Yes. This is my programmer, Tom, did this one. Right? The whole G matrix in the next generation is going to new, move to the position of the mean, right? I said, you know, what I really want more than anything when you do this animation is when, at this point, I want this sound effect. And Tom says, not an R. Not an R. <laughs> you know, like, eh. So if you know a solution to that. Okay, so, but now, uh, so, so, um, what you want to do is retool your intuition so that you can think about what correlated response, so you're not surprised by this, right? You're going to be a pool shark. You've got to know that <laughs> you're going to, the, the first question when you step up to the table is, what's the G matrix? Tell me, <laughs> what's the G matrix? And then once you know, you should be able to anticipate the pool game. Let's look at uh, a slightly more complicated animation named animation two. What is the G matrix? Allow block content if they use it. Here, here, here. All right, okay, so now we're not gonna change the, here's the G matrix and we're just gonna move around the table with the cue ball. Okay, the first one is easy, right? This is shot A. That was beta A with delta Z bar A. Here's case B. I think Monique asked me, I sh we looked at this, some of your Sao Paulo colleagues and I looked at this at lunch in Raleigh last, last June, and she said, is this, uh, she or somebody said, is this uh, uh, like a cartoon? And I said, what do you mean a cartoon? She said, did you make up these responses or did you calculate them? And I go, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna program this, you might as well program the matrix algebra. This, these are exact calculations. So, and we'll show you the script. I'll give you the script for this if you want. Okay. Um, but you're getting a, a sense of what's going on. So I, I would like to, in, in the fullness of time, you should come up with your own mental way of thinking about this. But one way of thinking about it is that an eccentric, a, a tilted G matrix like this tends to bias the response to selection in the direction of the leading eigenvector. And so if you happen, now here's an interesting fact, that if your the force of selection is perfectly aligned with the leading eigenvector, you get what I call a straight shot. There's only one other direction in which you get a straight shot. And guess what that is? Being on the other eigenvector, right? this way or that way, this way or that way. Those are the only times you get, a, you get a straight shot. Otherwise, you get a response to selection that is 
And that's what you want to fill in with your, your intuition. Okay, and then I think we're going to say the grand finale. <laughs> I think we need to shorten the pauses here. And the grand finale is... <laughs> maybe there is no. Tom, where's the grand finale? I don't know, maybe this wasn't the final version. Anyway, uh, you can see the, the so-called ghost there. Oh, well, I guess we're never going to get it. Okay, Tom, uh, Joe's looking at his watch. You're not? All right. Uh, ignoring all my... Going I, to I just wanted to add something. Oh, you did? Okay. I went away too fast? Um, I... It, it, you should also oh. notice... Yeah. Well, that's actually a good... How about that one? Well, they're both, they're both fine. Um, if you were to choose new axes here, so if you, t if you were to take the principal axes of, the, uh, of that covariance and plot instead everything on the principal axes, then you get a circular mm -hmm. um, contour, a circular uh, yeah, contour of density. Um, and your axes, well, actually, the axes could be any, any two orthogonal axes. And on that scale, if you if you hit it um, in any direction, it just it just moves straight forward. It moves forwardly and doesn't divert at all. But when you transform back and put it on this scale, then you find out it's exactly these motions. So put another way, we could rotate these axes, right? We could rotate the axes like this, and then we we'd have we would have a G matrix without a main diagonal, right? Uh, but now, uh, actually, I think what happens in that case is even though we have no genetic covariance, because we have unequal genetic variances, more on this axis than that axis, I don't think we get a conventional pool, pool, ga pool game. I, you, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was actually thinking of I choosing new axes and rescaling them so that the thing becomes circular. Yeah, but what I'm saying is just let's just rotate them before we circularize it. And I guess I guess it's going to be a conventional pull game. It's just that when you're in a direction, you know, yeah, because there there's no there are no genetic covariance terms. There's no correlated responses to selection. That should should give us a conventional pull game. But if you're but if you're sh when we rotate it, when you shoot this direction, you're going to get more of a response than when you hit the ball this direction. True. One one last comment, uh, just that in uh, that's way of just saying yes, yeah, what I said. Yeah, yes, uh, in in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado, one of the uh, punishments that the Mikado imagines for people who have committed various social gaffes is having to play pool with elliptical billiard balls, which really? which we are doing now. We are playing. Uh, here's the problem, though: the elliptical ball in the Mikado would, would flip and blah, 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 you know, so it's not quite that, but, but it's closer than thinking about a, a spherical ball. All right, we're so... Question in the back. Question in the back, yeah. So if you did... So if you did uh, switch... Uh, rotate. rotate the axes, then you would have unequal variances between sure. the two traits. Would that violate our uh, no, calculations? No, that's what I was just talking about, but maybe too fast to, for comprehension. So. In our, if we do that rotation, now we have, we're going to have a G matrix with two different terms on the diagonal, but no, no G12. So I could go back and show the, the equation, but you would see with, with G120, there would be no correlated response to selection, but the response you get would be very according to how. So obviously there's more genetic variance when you hit the ball this way than when you hit the ball that way. And there's an intermediate amount when you hit it this way. And that intermediate amount is going to, you, you're going to want to think about because you're going to fall short of the pocket, you know, if you don't take that into account. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about the practical implication of the response to selection. Yeah. Like the selection strength and the genetic co um, covariance between the traits are correlated most of the time. I mean, you need an enormous sample size. An empirical size result waiting to be established, I would say. 
because, I mean, you need an enormous sample size to disentangle the two. Because the selection can be dependent on the genetic covariance. Well, the response to selection will, yeah, but not the selection itself. Yeah. Beta doesn't depend on... on Delta well, Z bar tend, depends on both beta and, G, and GIJ. You know, theoretically, yes. Yeah. But the pra when you estimate the, the in the natural population, for example, yeah. I think it's very difficult to tease apart the two. Because suppose the response to selection can be dependent on the genetic covariance. So you see a correlation between the betas that is dependent on the genetic covariance. Uh, well, if you're within a generation, if you're within a generation and you're estimating beta from by the contrast between samples before and after selection, then G doesn't come into that estimation at all. That's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna do, I think later yeah. today. Yeah. We'll talk about that more. I think we we defer that until we get to the estimation of beta. Yeah, on that on that point, if if you think about um, ecological trade-offs between characters um, in which there are positive uh, traits that have a positive effect on fitness but they trade off against each other. There must be many cases in which you're near the boundary and selection is in fact trying to go in a direction where there is in fact essentially no genetic variation. It's trying to increase both traits unfortunately they're negatively correlated with each other. So I think that would work against the assertion that there is a, a, a connection between the direction in which selection is pushing you and genetic covariation. This is, this, we'll come back to this, but did you have a question? Yeah. Um, how do these matrices deal with plastic traits? Because doesn't that make the matrix unstable? Or is this just assuming that these traits? It doesn't necessarily make it unstable, but it makes it more complicated. So, so we are, remember, so we're, we're thinking about, for in the simplest case, and especially when we start talking about selection for the next couple of characters, we're going to be, like next, next couple of lectures, we're going to be thinking about a trait that doesn't change during the life of an individual. So when you look at Z bar, you look at Z, your, your phenotypic value, it's a constant. And if you've got, if you've, if you've got uh, one phenotype as an individual growing up in this circumstance and another phenotype in another circumstance, then we're going to have environment-specific traits or age-specific traits to get rid of the, the age problem. Or we're going to have function-valued traits to, so that for each individual, we know what your growth trajectory is. We're going to do something like that. And, and then in the space of ontogeny, experience, context, independent trait values, which we've accomplished, then this theory will apply. But of course, you know, if you're interested in that trajectory or whatever it is, then it's, it's a more complicated thing. Uh, it's, it's a you're looking at the evolution of a, uh, of a, a vector in, in ontogeny space or experience space. We're happy and sad that you brought this up because. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it, so this is why I didn't bring it up now because just just letting this you digest this much. Okay, so one further point before we go to our summary and our conclusions finally is that the beauty of the of the Q the pull game is that it, it works in the it, the space of two characters in a way that the it, and, and the the Galton thing of you know using S to describe selection doesn't isn't isn't very useful in two characters. The pool game, once you master the intuition, works as in, in as many dimensions as you want, right? But now instead of just walking around the table, when you go to three characters, you have to imagine going up a ladder to shoot down, right? The G matrix is a spheroid, and in four dimensions, it's the the ladder is even more awkward to climb and negotiate. But the thought processes are the same, and you can do it dimension by dimension, right? You can you can do your projections. So, so it does work. In, so, so so that's something to think about as you fall asleep tonight. A pool shot in four, five, and six dimensions. See how many? See how far? See how well you do. When yesterday when we were talking about wait, yesterday when we were talking.
talking about um, uh, univariate selection, we had an error or an environmental term in our equation. And then today, when we're talking about multivariate selection with the resulting phenotype, that term seems to have disappeared because now we just have G and beta. How does the equation... No, that's, all, that's all we have. Oh, oh, no, no, no. No, we haven't changed equations on you. Where did the environment go? <laughs> you ready? You're re okay, here's our response to selection equation. See it? Right. There, there's, no, there's no environment term there. Well, it's in the P matrix, right? Right, it's in the P matrix. Um, which contains beta. Which contains beta, so if you want to think about that. It's still there. Okay, it's so still it's there. Still yeah. there, it's just hiding inside of the beta matrix. It's hiding in plain sight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you can tease it out, right? You can always decompose beta into, into, into those three terms and multiply them out and keep track of, you know, you, you can do that. Okay. Try and do it in your head, that, like, like Ronald Fisher. That's, that's, that's good for, that's, that's sleep inducing I, in my experience. Okay, so you want to scroll down here. I think I can just do it this way. Where are we, where are we? I don't want to be privileged to do this. Okay, we're going to go to this slide. Uh, all right, we've almost learned, we've almost done. So, so what are we? What are our, our main? You know, we started out with three theses, and here's where we are. Uh, we're uh, we're now convinced that the G matrix, the additive genetic variance covariance matrix, is the key to understanding multivariate resemblance between parents and offspring. If you think, remember, resemblance of a single trait is on the main diagonal. Resemblance between two traits is in the off diagonal. No matter how many you know, how many traits we have. The consequence of number one is the G matrix is also the key to modeling multivariate responses to selection, but we'd have to know what, what selection was. Uh, and then three, the, the tricky thing is that G induces non-correlated responses to selection, and they may be non-intuitive, but only because uh, you haven't played enough mental pool with uh, elliptical Q balls or elliptical G matrix. Right, so you can you can make it intuitive if you want, and uh, that's what we'll strive to do. That 